Well, well, look who's here. Hey, he fans, welcome to another toy history lesson. We're off to Eternia for the history of and the Masters of the Universe! 1982 edition. The idea for this fantastical world of swords, sorcery, and science was first sparked in 1976, though, when Mattel CEO Ray Wagner turned down a young man trying to make a film about swords, sorcery, and science, and was looking for a company to produce toys to go along with the film. That young man was George Lucas, that movie was Star Wars, and that guy kicking himself was Ray Wagner, after seeing Kenner's Star Wars line sell like hotcakes throughout the late 70s and early 80s. Maybe the expression, sell like hotcakes, doesn't do it justice. Maybe the expression should, in fact, be changed to, sell like Kenner Star Wars figures, to put things in perspective. Wagner decided it was Mattel's turn to give kids something to play with. The concept of toys was put together by lead designer Roger Sweet, inspired by packaging designer Mark Taylor's art, and was approved. The original working title of Lords of Power was nixed due to its religious connotations, and the line was christened, oops, I mean, named, Masters of the Universe. Not bad, not bad at all. Realizing that just cool toys weren't enough for kids in the 80s, and part of the reason the Star Wars toys had sold so well was because of the synergy between the movie and the toys, Mattel sought out Donald F. Glutt to create a series of mini-comics to be included with the initial toys, due to the delays in the regular comic series by DC, which wouldn't hit the stands until November of that year, and an animated series that wouldn't debut until September of 1983. That would become the Filmation series we all know and love. But before Lou Scheimer and his team breathed his charming style of kid-friendly adventure and wisdom into the brand, the world of He-Man was a much darker, savage place. Very similar to Samaria, the homeland of Conan the Barbarian. Wonderful idea! The rights holders of Conan thought so too, and unleashed an army of savage lawyers upon Mattel. This is Skeletor's doing. The dispute stemmed back to an agreement the rights holders had with Mattel about producing a toy line for the Conan the Barbarian movie that was released in 1982 starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mattel eventually won the lawsuit because... Nothing is stronger than He-Man! Not even Conan the Barbarian. Although the similarities can't be disputed. Before he was a lazy prince that held aloft his magic sword to transform into the most powerful man in the universe, in the mini-comics, He-Man was a wandering barbarian, traveling across a war-torn Eternia. Emerging from an interdimensional rift is the evil Skeletor, whose mission is to unite the two halves of the Power Sword, which will gain him entry into Castle Greyskull and become the Master of the Universe. Unlike the Kenner Star Wars line, or the newly released Hasbro G.I. Joe A Real American Hero line, which both featured figures which were three and three quarter inches, the Masters of the Universe line was all about power. These figures would be an imposing five and a half inches, tall and wide. Okay, not quite five and a half inches wide, but they were certainly more muscular than anything that had been released before. Bulging muscles and a squat, ready to pounce stance made the Masters of the Universe some of the most intense, powerful looking toys ever created. While most kids' toys featured faces that were either happy or blank, the Masters featured grimaces, snarls, or no facial expression at all, in the most terrifying way possible. Even the hero, He-Man, the character who would become a symbol of virtue and honor featured a scowl as if he was using every bit of his power to hoist Grayskull on his back. <laughs> the box art wasn't exactly cheery either. Beautiful depictions of a savage setting that looked more fitting for the cover of a, well, a Conan novel than a toy box. The figures also employed some elements of earlier 12-inch G.I. Joe dolls or Mego figures with the removable harnesses and armor pieces. 
and each one featured a play feature, a spring in the waist that allowed each one to deliver the most powerful smack in the universe. Like with the initial line of G.I. Joe's, several parts were reused on each figure to offset costs. Eight figures were released in the first year, along with two vehicles, a beast, and a playset. The first year was split up in two releases. The first wave included a modest four figures, two heroes and two villains, and a beast. There was He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe. More or less. And also the most humble man in the universe. He featured a removable battle harness, a shield, a battle axe, and one half of the power sword, colored in gray to match his other accessories. Watch next. Why, it's you, Duncan. Or rather, man-at-arms, as he's better known, which is a term used to describe a heavily armored soldier. And heavily armored he was. He featured removable leg, arm, and chest armor, and a battle mace. And even though he was a man-at-arms, he could take on the evil forces of Skeletor without any weapons, thanks to his spring-loaded waist. I'll just have to take you on with my bare hands. He-Man's loyal companion, Battle Cat, was also released. Ah, let me at him, He-Man! Another cost-saving measure by Mattel, which reused the Tiger Mold from their Big Jim 10-inch figure line of the 70s. And two villains were also released in the first wave. And kids needed villains for their heroes to fight, right? You might change your mind when you see this! I'm sure there were quite a few parents who weren't too thrilled about buying their sweet, innocent 80s kids the Lord of Destruction, Skeletor. Featuring a terrifying skull face, years before such imagery became the norm in kids' toys. Oh, oh, what the hey? Oh, the man has no face. Oh, oh, Martha, why did you buy this thing for the kid? Oh, it's spooky. Oh. Skeletor featured a removable battle harness, the other half of the power sword, this time in purple, that could combine with He-Man's half, and the Havoc Staff, jam-packed with magic. My Havoc Staff will take care of you! And the fourth figure released was the hapless Beast Man, the savage henchman of Skeletor, or as I like to call him, Furface. Furface, is it? He included removable torso armor, a pair of spiked armbands, and a whip. He should have included a brush and some shampoo too, with how often he got thrown into a pool of mud by He-Man though. Yuck. Later in 82, the four remaining figures were released. The evil ocean warlord, Merman, added to Skeletor's forces. He didn't come with any shampoo either. Try swimming in mud! but he did include removable armor and a sword. The next figure is quite the oddity. It's Zodak, the Cosmic Enforcer, who was originally an evil minion of Skeletor. Although his packaging says he's an enforcer, in the DC Comics and Filmation series we would learn, I cannot use my powers to change things. In a world of good and evil, Zodak was unique. Not just for Masters of the Universe, but all toy lines, for being in the gray area. The observer in the middle who tried to maintain a balance of harmony between the two extremes by preaching perception over power. There's beauty all around us. Protect it before it's too late. It's a rare occurrence in toys, having a character that started off as a villain and then was changed to being neutral despite no actual change to the toy and minimal changes being made to the packaging. When you don't have a dog in the fight, you don't need that many accessories apparently. So Zodak only included removable armor and a small laser. Two more heroic masters were released in late 82. There was the Winged Warrior. Gatos! Who provided He-Man with some air support. Count on that! Stratos didn't include any actual weapons, just a removable harness and wings. Despite not having any weapons, Stratos could make himself useful by giving Skeletor's minions a ride with an unhappy landing. Nice work, Stratos! And the final figure of 82 was the Captain of the Guard, 
It's Tila, the adopted daughter of Man at Arms. I was honored to adopt you as my own daughter. Despite being a toy line mainly aimed at boys, Mattel included a female figure because girls have the power too. Your daughter is the best warrior in Eternia. And like with Scarlet in the initial year of G.I. Joe, Tila was a valuable reminder to young boys that heroism has no specific gender, age, or even species on Eternia. Tila included a removable headdress, shield, and staff. Just like with G.I. Joe, the villains didn't get any vehicles in the initial year. The two that were released were intended for He-Man and his friends. Put your battle ram in high gear and head back home. There was the battle ram, which could hold two figures and featured a firing missile. The front portion could detach from the back, giving not just Stratos the power of flight. And some more air support with the Wind Raider. Now it's pretty impressive when someone can summon a horse by whistling, but how many can summon a flying vehicle the same way? The Wind Raider featured movable wings and rudder, and wheels to let it roll along the floor. It also had a hook to reel in even the biggest fish. Here's where I give you the hook. And the final release for 1982 was one of the most iconic playsets ever. Castle Grayskull. It's become part of pop culture history now. The well-known home of He-Man and the source of all his power. But in 1982, it was the creepy castle fortress of this very intense looking small line of action figures. Skeletor will try to take Castle Grayskull. And if a toy line needed a good storyline to keep kids attention, that was it in a nutshell for Masters of the Universe. Defend Castle Grayskull from Skeletor. In a world of magic and technology, it was a simple, downright medieval concept that drove the imagination of many young masters of the universe. Defend the castle. But Grayskull was so much more than just a castle. It was a magical and mysterious character itself, complete with a face. Well, as much of a face as Skeletor had, the front featured a giant skull with black wash on it to accentuate the shadows and it looked weathered and moldy. Another rarity in the toy world where everything was supposed to look new and shiny right out of the box. This thing looked like it had been left in the backyard for five years. It doubled as a playset and carrying case, featuring tabs that could seal it up with figures inside and a handle for easy carrying. Inside were a number of different play features. There was a training device to practice the most powerful smack in the universe extra weapons with a weapon rack to store them on, and various built-in gimmicks, like the mounted laser cannon, working elevator, jaw bridge activated by inserting the power sword, and, boy, what I'd give for a trap door right now. Funny you should mention that. A trap door activated by moving the throne, which kind of looked like Zodak's cosmic space chair. And various stickers to make this creepy playset somehow even creepier. Again, remember this is before sectars, visionaries, inhumanoids, supernaturals, and other creepy, eerie, or scary toys that would follow in years to come. The Masters of the Universe was an instant success, spurring everyone at Mattel to say with a sigh of relief, Thank goodness He-Man showed up. Thank goodness. Although the initial incarnation of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe wouldn't last as long as its main competitors, G.I. Joe and Transformers, the line would still go on to enjoy great success. Countless figures, more playsets, an entire spin-off toy line and show, this time aimed at young girls, and a live-action movie starring one of the most in-demand stars in Hollywood at the time. 1983 would build on the success of the initial year with more memorable characters, this time with all new play features and less reusing of parts. But that's a story for another episode. Thanks for observing the history of Masters of the Universe, 1982 edition. 
Leave a comment below if you have an attorney in memory you'd like to share. And if you like what I'm doing here, consider supporting the channel on Patreon. As a thanks, you'll get access to Patreon-only exclusive videos, like this week's in-depth review of the original 1982 Wind Raider. If you're in the mood for more Eternian history, check out Battle Ram, a He-Man blog on WordPress, an amazing resource of Masters of the Universe history and box art images. Feel free to share the video, and to join the tribe, hit subscribe. Till next time, friends, remember, you have the power. Farewell, my friends. Nerd mistake.